Good morning. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. I uh, want you to know that this week is our last week that is Alabaster Month. Alabaster Month, uh, we do twice a year, February and September, where we are giving to help uh, build churches and, and schools and orphanages and medical facilities in, in places where otherwise they wouldn't have them on the mission field. And so that's where all this uh, goes for. If you want to give to that, that's what our wooden church on the uh, altar rail is for. But uh, we are uh, thankful for uh, your continued commitment uh, to our missions and uh, uh, to our church. Uh, after this service, um, I'll be meeting downstairs for anyone who is interested in finding out more about the Church of the Nazarene, what we believe, who we are. And um, if you haven't told me but want, want to show up, let me know. And uh, we can do that. It kind of it serves as a membership class, but if you're already a member, you're like, oh, I want to hang out and talk about this some more, yeah, let's do that too. We can do that together. Uh, also, we are collecting crisis care kits again. And so this time of year, uh, during the Lent season, we'll do that, and then uh, we'll gather those crisis care kits. Uh, we'll present them. Uh, uh, at, at district assembly, we have somebody on the district who holds all of those together, uh, and then those get distributed wherever the Church of the Nazarene says, okay, here's where the next crisis is, where we need to be able to send those out. And so uh, I give those to them at assembly. And, and I love that over the last uh, couple of years that, uh, uh, that I know I, I've been here, or a few years that I've been here, uh, we've done very well at uh, assembling a good number of those. And so thank you for that. If you want to... Um, Get some of the supplies the next time you're out. Feel free to do that. If not, and you want to make an offering uh, for that, um, we'll, we'll send someone out to, uh, to get that for you. But also we have some new Reflecting God devotionals. We have a number of different opportunities, of course, for us to stay connected, to stay engaged in God's Word here in the church. We have the Reflecting God devotionals, which come on a regular basis that are hanging up on the wall there, and uh, you can grab one of those. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the daily scripture readings that are a part of our uh, weekly inserts in the bulletin. Uh, we have our small group that is meeting on Tuesday mornings that's going through a book together. We have a wonderful Sunday school class that Bruce is leading. And so you have uh, opportunities, of course, to be engaged as much as you want to continue to learn uh, uh, from scripture and how we can apply that to our life and uh, thankful for those opportunities. But uh, glad to be able to worship with you today and just want to make sure that uh, uh, you're aware of those kind of things uh, going on right now. Let's, uh, let's, let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll hear the call to worship. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for each one here. Lord, uh, you, are, uh, you are our joy. You are our strength. And uh, we pray that uh, you would be honored in our worship and uh, in our lives, and that, Lord, you would be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our call to worship is Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow, to, follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for, I f for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. Why don't you stand with me and we'll sing together.
together. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this place. We, are, we have come here today to, uh, to hear from your Holy Spirit, to receive your guidance, to uh, understand your will for us uh, in our lives right now. And we are praying that, um, that we would hear and that we would feel uh, the comfort and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I want to lift up to you today those who come this morning with uh, special prayer requests, with needs and concerns. And Lord, uh, you know what those are. And we're so grateful that we can take this moment and in our hearts just kind of lift them up to you and say, Lord, this is, this is where I'm at and this is what I need right now. And that, Lord, you, you hear that and you respond to that. And Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are watching right now and can't be with us and those who are ill and praying for your health and your safety and and your providence in their lives right now. Uh, I'm so glad, Lord, that we have this opportunity to come before you, always to remember that our life, our, our day to day, every breath that we take is because you have gifted us and blessed us with that. And so, Lord, uh, we pray that you would be honored in everything that we do, in every breath that we take, in every step. Thank you again for loving us and being with us. We want to honor you today in our worship. Bless this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have this opportunity this morning to honor the Lord uh, through giving. If you would like to uh, give uh, at this time, feel free to come forward and bring your offering to the offering plate. seated and enjoy the food of his holy word today. Good morning. I'm reading today from Leviticus 19 verses 1 and 2 and then 9 through 18. 
The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And then nine. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that the, those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. This is the word of the Lord.
Have you ever had, had someone ask you to do something? And you're like, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Just one of those <laughs> absurd requests. To this day, my dad, every now and again, when he, uh, will, will talk with me, and he'll, he'll still say to this day, I still can't believe when you got me up on that mountain, you took me on knife's edge. And uh, he says uh, from that time when we uh, went on Katahdin together, he still says, if I would have known how bad that was, I would have never walked that trail. I guess he didn't like the sheer cliff on one side and the 50-foot drop on the other with a ledge that was just as wide as our waist. Like, that was just one of those absurd things. He will not do that again. Uh, it would be like today, uh, here in February. Someone's like, hey, you want to take a dip in the ocean? You know, join the Polar Bear Club? You're like, that's absurd. I'm not going to do something like that. You might have your reason, but I'm not going to do it. It's like uh, the first time someone said to me, hey, Tim, do you think this is the year we vote third party? And I thought, I don't know. Is this the year we throw our vote away? And so like, like, like it just on the face, it seems absurd. It's like when my, my sister used to ask when I was kid, hey, hey, Tim, I'm, I'm watching The Sound of Music. Do you want to watch it with me? And I said, oh, I think I have to go to a dentist appointment. <laughs> like, it was just absurd requests. Absurd request. Now, now, certainly, certainly there might be reasons that people have good reasons for any number of those things. But on the, on, on the face, it just seems that it doesn't make any sense at all. It's absurd. Uh, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, is about to say some things that at its face is going to be like, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. What is he getting at here? And of course, there's some reasons behind it. There's some ideas behind it, and we're, so we're going to look at that together uh, today. Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 38 to 48. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, we'll give your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. Don't refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect." This, this is a passage of Scripture right in the middle of his sermon where you read this and you say, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> how, how serious is Jesus about this? Because when I, when I hear this, it seems to be pretty, pretty out there. Out there like jumping in the water right now or watching the sound of music. Like not something that I like, like, want to do. But uh, he says right off the bat, he says, uh, you know, you've heard... Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. You do this to me, I'm doing this to you. But he says to him, he says, don't resist an evildoer. And this word resist, and there's all kinds of ways, of course, to resist evil. We can resist evil with the same force that they use or greater to defeat them. Uh, there's, all, there's also a history of even like nonviolent resistance. There's all kinds of ways to resist. Uh, and the way in which this word resist shows up in other documents as well is it's a word that often is used to refer to armed resistance. It's Jesus' way perhaps of telling his disciples and his followers, I'm not raising up zealots to uh, overthrow Rome. Uh, as indeed he would end up saying when he got arrested, what, you think I raised up an army or something that you would come with men with swords to come and arrest me? And so he says, We're, do not resist evildoers. And then, he's, and then he goes on when he says, uh, when, if someone strikes you on the right cheek. Now it's one of those things where if you imagine someone striking you on the right cheek, it means one of two things. It means either they're left-handed, I mean if, it's just, if they're just hitting you once, or, or, or it, is the most, it is the most demeaning insult with the backhand. 
It is, and when he says to turn the other cheek, it is his way of saying the worst kind of insult, the worst kind of way in which someone can indeed hurt you or come at you and insult you. He says, turn the other cheek. And that seems odd to read. Like, how do we make sense of this statement? No one is going to advocate that someone should just withstand abuse and accept more. My uncle had a way of looking at it. My uncle was the kind of guy who uh, in third grade could beat up the fifth graders. He was always bigger than everybody else. His way of looking at this is, you got two shots to knock me down, then I'm coming after you. <laughs> That's what, the, my uncle was big and rural. You get in the picture? <laughs> like just one of those big, strong farm boys. And so he, uh, that, was, that was his mindset. But I don't think Jesus is quite looking at it that way either. That just seems to fall very quickly back into eye for eye, tooth for tooth kind of language. I remember when he told that, we laughed. And then I thought, well, I don't know if that's what he means, but okay. Uh, he goes on and says, you know, if, uh, uh, if someone is going to force you to go a mile, go the second mile as well. In looking and studying this, I found out that uh, when the editors say go a mile, that they weren't just translating the word for us English-speaking American Christians, you know, who measure everything by the mile. Uh, when, when I looked into this more and more, I found that uh, this word that we translate as mile is indeed where we get the word mile from. Milion, which is the Roman measurement for that long distance. Uh, and so he says, if, if you are to go that distance, we'll go another one. And why might that be significant? Well, the New Testament, written in the Greek language that they were speaking at the time, the major trade language, the Greek language that in large part was introduced um, uh, by uh, Alexander the Great, long time before the Romans came, that then became a part of what everyone was speaking. This, this language, the, the usual word for a long term of measurement is stadia. And I know this is the most boring thing you could ever hear, but stadia. And you're saying to yourself, oh, wait, have I heard that before? In the book of Revelation, the measurements of the kingdom of heaven, how long, how wide, how high, is measured in this term stadia. And, it, 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 and of course, that measurement isn't just to say, of course, how big heaven is, but to say it's perfect in size and ready for us. But um, this word is also used, uh, it's going to come to a good point, I promise you. This, this word study is also used by a Jewish historian who ends up writing for the Romans. And so it's funny, if, if he's writing for the Romans, you would think maybe he would use their ter term of measurement. But no, most often, the, the word used, both in the New Testament and in a historian writing for the Romans after Jesus' time, is this word stadia. And so it's just, it was the more common, well-known unit of measurement. It's like someone saying kilometers to us today. We'd be like, wait, what? Hold on, I think it's 0.6 of a mile or point, whatever it is. You know, we're trying to figure that out. And so in the same way for him to say million, where we came up with the word mile, is, is for him to use a specific Roman term that isn't in the vernacular, isn't the common language. And I can't help that he is hinting at the kind of military conscription that would happen sometimes. Soldiers going from one place to another, and they say, hey, carry my bag for me. Carry my supplies for me. And they would force the citizens to walk with them. And it would absolutely put them out. If you have to walk a mile or two miles to uh, help the very people who are currently occupying their land, it is the worst insult. It puts you out for the rest of your day. It is not what anybody there wants to do. And Jesus references that situation and says, and we're going to go the extra mile. This is this, this, this concern about retaliation, this, 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 this concern about how it is we're going to take care of and we're going to approach those who often seem to be taking something away. Even that last verse, give to everyone who begs from you. We all know why we don't give when we choose not to. It's because we're, we think to ourselves, 
I don't think this is actually going to help you. <laughs> we think, oh, you're just going to take and use this for whatever means. That hasn't changed over thousands of years. When people didn't give to those who begged then, it was the same reason. Why should I give you what I worked hard for when you're just going to waste it? And Jesus says, give to everyone who begs. Don't refuse anyone who wants to borrow. And so all of these kind of statements are those kinds of statements that just at first, like, man, this, this all just sounds absurd. Yeah, there might be a reason behind it, but at first glance, like, it doesn't make sense that this is, this is what you might call us to do. In fact, we realize that this kind of behavior, what it's not going to do is it's not going to alter their behavior. None of this is a solution for making things better. It's not at all. But Jesus doesn't propose a solution there. He just is, is indicating a better way of living other than whatever you do to me, I'm going to do to you. And so he says again, you know, you've heard love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, originally that saying would be a saying meant to emphasizing loving your neighbor. When, 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 when it says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, it's a way of saying there should be no space for hate among your neighbor. If there's anyone you're going to hate, it should be your, your enemy. It's a way of just kind of emphasizing, again, how important it is to love your neighbor. And Jesus expands that even more and says, this is what you've heard. And, and, and we've settled, it's almost like he's saying, you, we've settled too much into the hate your enemy kind of line of thinking. But this call to love is a call that spreads out even to your enemies. For they experience all the same things we do. They're getting snow right now as well. And so this is a part of what Jesus calls us to as a descriptor of, of, of where love might still be able to go. And it's hard to read this. We find ourselves saying, can he really mean this? It all just sounds absurd. Is this just figurative speak? Already we saw hyperbole before in his sermon uh, when he was talking about, you know, disfiguring yourself instead of going to hell. Like we knew that was exaggeration. That was just hyperbole. Is this more of that? And without a doubt, there seems to be indeed some, some examples here of, okay, this just seems to be a little bit over the top, but it doesn't change the heart of the matter. We're called to love even when it's hardest. And even when they are the hardest to love. And I think this passage is supposed to shock us. I think we're supposed to read this and go, wait, what? It's supposed to challenge us. And I think when it stops shocking us, it means we've tamed it. <laughs> you know, when, you, when, when something is tamed, it's domesticated, it's controlled, it no longer has its bite. <laughs> it doesn't affect us anymore. And I think if we get too easily into the habit of explaining this passage away, and trust me, I have to do everything I can to not try to explain too much of this away. I think it, we, we no longer take it seriously. But, God, but Jesus is very serious about the love that God calls us to have, even for those who are most difficult. Christian behavior is meant to be abnormal. <laughs> to the negative attitudes and acts that we face in our world. We are a people who choose a positive response where others might choose a negative response. And so when he talks about loving for enemies and, and even praying for those who persecute us, praying for enemies forces us to see them as God sees them, to recognize that there's a conflicted humanity in that person. One of the things I found that's so easy to do when we make enemies and we, we recognize someone has done something wrong, we're very quick to use terms and phrases that turn them into something other than human, a monster, a demon. Uh, we use terms that seem to kind of strip them of their humanity. But when we pray for them, we're forced to see this person might just be someone God can redeem. This might be someone God cares about. And if so, maybe it's someone that I too might be called to, compare, uh, to, to, uh, to care about. There, there, there's examples again and again in history of, of radical moments of forgiveness that never seemed like it would be possible. 
whether it's Nelson Mandela's Forgiveness Commission in South Africa that helped people to heal during a great racial strife and not just when a new group gets in power, well, now we subject the other group. When Dietrich Bonhoeffer goes to prison for trying to act against Hitler, what he does in prison is he treats the prison guards with extra kindness, even though they're the ones who are going to end up leading him to the gallows. When Martin Luther King Jr. opposes violence and the exercise of violence to try to bring about change and radical change, and at the time it is perceived as completely antisocial, completely uh, detrimental to the way in which um, society functions, but yet he does so in a way that refuses violence and allows the speaking against injustice through nonviolent ways. And the sin of violence, the sin of violence done against him and against black people during his time, spoke against itself condemned itself as well as it became evident again and again at just how terrible were the things happening. Uh, It has made massive inroads in our community recognizing that passages like this sometimes God can use in miraculous ways when we say, well, maybe Jesus is kind of serious when he says things like this. It's why uh, I I think I like the passage, or I like the song, Reckless Love, that we've been singing the last couple of months. That second verse, while I was a foe, (laughs) he loved us, cared for us. And that's part of Jesus' call here, is that even while someone is a foe, God might be able to redeem and change. And so for us to seek for that rather than to seek vengeance. It helps us remember that God is the one who avenges and not ourselves. And so we are called to act out of this love, not to act out of fear or hurt or or, or a sense of privilege or a sense of uh, revenge, but, but of always recognizing God might be up to something I don't know yet. And, it's a, and this is an interesting passage because it's, it's hard to look at this. And I know that sometimes there are people who might be hearing this message and, and, and read this as a, oh no, well, I guess I'll just subject myself again to an abuser or somebody who is, who is destroying them. And that is something I would never want to advocate because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to empower someone to think, oh, someone's just going to let me do what I want to do. But yet, this passage speaks to us today in a way that says, we are not just going to be a people who are just looking to find new power over somebody else who's wronged us. But we are going to hope and we are going to pray that God does something radical in our life and the lives of those around us. And it is, it's a hard calling. It's a hard message to read. It seems absurd, as absurd as any of those fun things I got to mention before. But uh, uh, this is one of those where Jesus speaks to his people, reminds them and tells them that our God has a plan and a purpose, and we are going to live in the love and the call of God and hope and pray for God's redemptive power to redeem a world, to redeem a society, to redeem indeed the relationships we have rather than acting in constant conflict with one another as we seek just another another moment of revenge or another moment of uh, I need what I need. And so uh, I share this passage with you today and hope and prayer that we would allow it to keep its bite. Allow it to... uh, uh, to convict, to, to speak to us, to challenge us, to stretch us. Because we're going to find opportunities where indeed we say, oh, but wait a minute, I don't know if I totally get this. Uh, Jesus must just be kind of exaggerating here. What's his call here? And Jesus is reminding us again, you've heard it said, this is the law, but the point has always been, God wants to restore justice 
and he wants to reconcile people, and he wants to help us to grow in love. And so let us open up our hearts to God, the one who gave his son up for us while we were yet sinners. While we were still intent on sending him to the cross, he said, I still love this world. I still have made a promise and a covenant with these people, and I want to redeem them. And we as his followers get to look for ways in which we get to exercise that grace as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for passages of Scripture that um, uh, are not easy to explain away or to talk about, but passages of Scripture that just sometimes don't make sense, except, Lord, we see that we have been called to follow your Son, someone who is crucified for us and for our salvation. And so, Heavenly Father, Help us to follow faithfully. Help us to follow knowing full well that you are the God who has the last word. And you are the God that promises a resurrection. And so let us live boldly and faithfully to the calling of love that you have placed upon our lives. Knowing full well that you are with us and you will bring redemption. Thank you again for uh, the life, the example in, the, in these words of your Son, Jesus Christ, it's, his, it's in His name that we pray and that we have learned to pray the words that He taught us to pray. Let us pray His prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to receive communion today, and it's an opportunity for us to um, uh, receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace that uh, loves us, redeems us and was reckless enough to love us while we were still foes. Feel free to come forward and receive it today. I want to uh, share with you a brief word from Scripture before we receive these elements. There are words that um, come.
come from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They're words that oftentimes I say in some way, shape, or form um, during uh, the receiving of the elements. I guess, I guess for a long time you've been receiving um, the uh, New International Tim's version or something like that. But uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I'll give it to you uh, in the words of the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and receive his body. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink this together. To proclaim the Lord's death is to put ourselves fully into the grace of our Lord, knowing indeed there's a resurrection and there is a hope, even in the midst of whatever it is that comes our way. Let's sing together, Jesus Calls Us, in closing today. Amen. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives, while best the singing, day by day his sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world. Lord Jesus Christ be with you and his spirit strengthen you to love where it's hardest. Go with his grace. Amen. Amen. Be safe on your way out there. The snow is still falling.